Duh. I do not know why this system cannot say, obviously the problem is systemic. Obviously we need to make a choice between being the most incarcerated country in the world and lighting all of this money on fire for incarceration and putting that money back into those zip codes. Because, because putting the money back in the zip codes might actually fix it. God knows incarceration and probation and parole are not, and we have abundant science to that. So anyway, that is a somewhat more general talk about the smaller talk, and I will not go on forever because we have too many interesting people that say too many interesting and important things here. But, um, you know, the cost of keeping a juvenile in a secure placement in Pennsylvania is approximately $225,000 a year. Everybody talks about 50,000 or so to incarcerate an adult. It's about 225,000 in Pennsylvania to incarcerate a juvenile in secure placement. It's about 160,000 to keep a juvenile in placement that is not considered to be secure. And they do not do well educationally when they come out and they do not cease to have problems with the criminal justice system and they do not end up employed. It is obviously the wrong system and so we are moving, as is the rest of the country, towards initi initiatives to have people closer to home. We are also moving towards initiatives to deal with young adults, to deal with people who are in the range of 18 to 25 and to actually read what the U.S. Supreme Court said when the U.S. Supreme Court said that the juvenile brain is not reaching a level of maturity until approximately 25. This has been done in other jurisdictions. It makes a lot of sense, but it is one more indication, I think, of the direction that the criminal justice system really needs to go, which is that the whole system's got to look at and act like the juvenile system instead of what has been going on in the last 50 years, which is one cynical legislator after another has been trying to tear down and degrade the juvenile justice system by finding 106 reasons why juveniles had to be held in adult custody, why they had to be tried in adult court, and why they had to go to adult jails when so much of that was absolutely 100% unnecessary and there were better solutions. The good news, I think, is that the juveniles are gonna win, and you're gonna win, I'm gonna tell you why. In Philadelphia, the millennial vote has increased 350% in 10 years. 350%. One of the most successful strategies that was used in Philadelphia for people who were being stepped on, and they were people who suffered from addiction, was used by an organization called ODAT, O-D-A-A-T, otherwise known as One Day at a Time. And their theory was that if people were in recovery and they were trying to return to their full potential as participants in society, as citizens, that what they should do is they should participate politically. So they would go out and they would get petitions signed for people who were running for judge. And they would go out and they would work on election day. And they would do so either as volunteers or they would do so in a way that is compensated. And guess what? one day at a time, ended up getting all kinds of love from members of the judiciary, and it ended up getting all kinds of love from politicians, and it ended up getting all kinds of support because those people who were getting stepped on became useful. Well, to the extent that what you are doing in terms of trying to lift up at-risk youth, youth who are out of school, youth who are unemployed, to the extent that incorporates the reality there's a thirst among young people to be involved in the political process. There's the accurate sense that they've been stepped on and ignored to the extent that they start to participate. You're going to see a different world. And if you wonder about that, then you might want to look at who was the candidate who took the youth vote in every single state in the United States in the Democratic primary. It was the most progressive candidate who was running at that time. So I would encourage any and all of you to make sure that in your dealings with young folks, that they are reminded that yes, they have that much control over the future and that their participation can make such an enormous difference. And now, as they say in the church, I'm gonna get out of the way so you can all worship and we can actually hear from, from people who know more about this than I do. Thank you very much.
to go first. Why do you step first? There you go, you do the tweet us. Well, first of all, let's thank Larry again for the remarks that he just gave us this morning. And I've asked to join me now on stage uh, a couple of people that many of you probably already know. Um, one, Kevin Bethel, who's a fellow with the Philadelphia Police School Diversion Program. Thank and welcome him. <laughs> And then Kier Bradford Gray, who, and you know, if I had to pick a title, I'd love this one, Chief Defender. That's right. <laughs> uh, which is a fantastic one. Please thank, thank her you. for joining us. <laughs> and then Larry, um, who will join our conversation as well. And I want to start out, um, Kevin and Kier, just by asking you to reflect on the comments that you just heard from Larry. And obviously, I can, you can see it in the way that you all greet and, and engage one another, that you know each other well, you know each other's work. So feel free to weave that into it. But please share with us your reflections on what you've heard this morning. Absolutely. Kira, right. do you want to start? Well, um, I think what Larry said today was spot on in terms of what drives some of our criminal justice practices and policies. Um, Looking at what we've seen over the years is a easy solution, which is using our criminal justice system, to very complex issues. And instead of dealing with those issues, we would rather spend money on this false perception that this actually makes us safe by locking people up and kind of releasing them when they've learned their lesson. But their lessons are in their social conditions. Their lessons are in some of the uh, lack of educational opportunities that they have, lack of economic opportunities. So these are not lessons that one can fix by trying to use the deterrent factor or the punishment factor. Um, there has to be a real commitment to looking at what drives the behaviors. And I think what Larry has been bringing to light is something that our office has always been saying, is that, look, we're not going to fix the problem until we fix the cause. And um, now there's another face with another platform that can raise awareness around these things that can actually help lend some hand to our work that we do at the Public Defender's Office and making sure that people understand the people who come before us. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on, on two things. One, you talk about another hand that can help us with that work and talk about what that means literally on the day-to-day, month-to-month, year-to-year, to have that additional set of hands doing the work. And then also if you could talk about the resistance. I mean, as Larry said to me, some of this, and we know it, is common sense. And yet, the resistance to it, year over year, generation over generation, I mean, you look at our history, and it's there, if you can talk about what it means to push back against that kind of resistance. So the narrative has always been told through the lenses of law enforcement. And Larry being a chief law enforcement officer, bringing a different message is really helpful uh, to the understanding, but also to the analysis of, hey, wait a minute, is everything we heard about what we're doing in the criminal justice system correct? Um, and then the stars align, right? Because there's certain things that have happened as we move along this reform journey that really shed a huge light on the issue of probation and parole or the issue of bail. I mean, we had the Khalif Browder story that Jay-Z, who's got to the masses with his platform, was able to bring out. Um, we had the Meek Mill situation that shed light on how people could go to jail for very minor things, but spend an enormous time in jail and lose everything. These are things that the Defender Association has always been saying, but we don't have a camera or we don't have a, uh, you know, we can't call a reporter and say, hey, look at what we're seeing, look at the trends and patterns. Our office has always really dealt with the individual, always collected data, stories, and information about why they're here. And we present those in a courtroom as mitigation per se, and whether it's believed or accepted or not, stays in those four corners of that courtroom. Mm -hmm. um, Larry helping to bring a new message outside of the courtroom allows us to really look at this in a different way. And the narrative is now shifting and people are becoming much more educated about the issues. Yeah. I have to say the idea of prosecutors and defenders working together, when I, mean, I think historically work I did when I lived in Washington, it, that's, that's a different story. 
and it's the right one, but it is, is very, very different than it's things the in the right past. One for the top leadership. Mm -hmm. I mean, because at the end of the day, you know how you'd like your criminal justice system to work, and you know what you'd like it to work for, and you don't want it to drive poverty. And I think that two leaders like Larry and myself, we're not battling in the courtroom over who's right and who's wrong. We're actually trying to work out interesting uh, options or opportunities for our system to get it right. Kevin, okay. your reflections. Oh, for, for just for the purpose of, of a clarification, not clarification, but build it out. I, I'm a retired deputy commissioner from the Philadelphia Police Department. Uh, I ran the operations for the city uh, for the last eight years, and I retired in 2016. So kind of like a double agent up here uh, <laughs> in, in, in a sense that, you know, what, what, what the DA uh, referenced about this pressure of the system, you know, what I would come to understand is, you know, it's broken. And then what my law enforcement and the men and women who work for me are getting was all of this system failures. And who is the front end of that system is the police officer. You know, for years when he talked about poverty and when I talked about academics, they were teaching me about hotspot policing and data driven strategies and look at the data on the screen and tack the data and the crime will come down. You know, as we reduce mental health and, and we drop mental health into our communities, the policing was asked to deal with mental health, so they're going to give me tasers and they're going to give me stun guns and they're going to give me all this stuff to deal with that. When the homeless population, you know, was, we're not going to deal with homelessness, as you see, even in today, well, the police department, we want you to lock them up, take them off the street. And, and so part of this process is really an awareness of, I would have started to ask myself, where does all this come from? You know, and it starts early upstream, as the DA said, when locking up a child, locking up a 10-year-old child and expect that there's gonna be a different result. And then I also blame myself because I ran this process. I'm born and raised in the city of Philadelphia for my life and I'm locking up children. And how does that impact their lives? And as I started to step on the other side of this process, I started to understand that this has to change. And it's not gonna change just because my good friends, colleagues here are making change. It's law enforcement making a different decision upstream. If I'm going to work better in the community, if I'm going to have better results, it talks about how I can change that. Because for me, reform is not just about, and I'm hitting a key, couple of key points that Larry brings up. We could sit there and make policy decisions all day long. I'm not going to do this with this kid or that adult. But if I'm not going to introduce services, if I'm not going, if he or she's addicted, and I'm just going to say, okay, I'm not going to lock them up. They can get locked up 10 times, but I'm not going to do anything with them. Well, that's not reform. That's right. Part of this process now is really getting in and doing the work understanding the trauma. I was walking down Art Street today and I see there's a shelter. There's been near a shelter at, 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 on a 1300 block of Arts for, for decades. And I see a mother coming out with her kids. And I'm sitting there saying, these kids are coming out of a shelter right now. I can only imagine what their lives must be like to be living in that temporary setting. And that child will walk into school somewhere. And what are we doing with him or her? What happens when majority of my foster kids come into, go from dependency to into the, being adjudicated? And these are kids we have, we know who they are. And so for me, the, the process and the things that the DA raised are what's going to change this whole process and, and at the same time benefit law enforcement to say, hey, you know, we can do things differently and we have to be a part of that change process. When you talk to your friends, former colleagues, not only across Philadelphia, but around the country, to what extent do you see that kind of shift taking place in their thinking? Yeah. It's a slow change. Mm -hmm. You know, I told people 30 years ago, I was given a pair of handcuffs, a, a baton, and said, have at it. I was 8,000 men and women in the police department. They said, if you see 8,001 is when you should get nervous. I was taught to lock people up. No one ever taught me another option. It was for those other folks and others in this community to deal with that. My job was to arrest them. And so you think about that, and we've also been through that constant pendulum shift, right? We're gonna be soft on crime, we're gonna be tough on crime, we're gonna be all these different things. Police chiefs, the average lifespan of a police chief is four years. And so that constant changing, and so it's going to take a period of time. You know, coming out of the Ferguson riots and the Baltimore riots and the 21st century policing report, which kind of, kind of tried to set a blueprint across the nation, but it took us a long, we've been in this space for a long time. Commissioner Ramsey used to say we were, policing has been on the wrong side of law longer than it's been on the right side of law. And that's a true statement. And, and so it's going to take us a while to retrain our men and women, 
Uh, but I feel there is momentum, kind of got changed with this administration, let's be honest. Uh, we're actually shifting back to a more hardcore policing. But most of the men and women, the leaders today, the community is asking for a different type of leadership, and many of them are responding. And it's, but it's going to take a while for that to, to, to continue to move across the nation. Yeah. Larry, I want to bring you back into the conversation. As you all may have noticed, it's not you're not hallucinating. We're missing one person. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, um, Adam is ill and not able to join us this morning. But Larry, I know that you and Adam have worked very closely together. And I want to start with you, but ask you all about the specific work that's being done to bring about the kind of change that we're talking about. I mean, thinking about the audience here, people from across the country who are doing wonderful work, deep work, but will go back home and want to take new ideas or refine the things that they're already working on. I'm wondering if you all can talk about some of the specific efforts that are taking place here. And Larry, I was wanting to start with you and your work sure. and engagement with Adam. Um, so, you know, the, we are working with Adam. We, I am blessed to have as one of my first assistants, Bob Listenby, who before he was in my office was a Stonely Fellow and before that, he ran the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention for Barack Obama, which is kind of sort of like running juvenile justice for the United States of America. And before that, he was the, <laughs> he was the chief of the juvenile unit at the Philadelphia Public Defender's Office, a magnificent <laughs> institution read by, led by his capable leader right here. Um, and Bob is, you know, his life's work really has been juvenile. So he has come up with a group of new policies that we are pursuing, and we've seen some real results. Just one example. When we came into office January of 18, there were about 40-some kids up on State Road, meaning in the adult county facilities. Uh, and while federal law will take care of this problem soon enough, within about the next 15 months, it will make that illegal. We have been pushing as hard as we could ever since to try to get them out of there. I think we're down now somewhere in the range of 10 to 12. Depends on the day, sometimes a little bit higher. But one example, no girls in uh, county custody, adult county custody, and there were when we first came in. The, the number of cases that are being certified from juvenile court to adult court for trials and for punishing under the adult system is way down. And the number of, of cases uh, where juveniles are already in the adult system is reducing because we are sending them back. Not every single case, of course, but it is a real strong trend in a different direction. What is not in our wheelhouse, unfortunately, and this is also true of the defenders, is we just don't have that pot of money. There's nothing I'd like more than to have the ability to do exactly what Bethel's talking about, which is provide the services. That remains in the hands of the city. And so, you know, when Kira and I go in front of the city today and talk about our own budgets, we can only hope that they'll also listen to our polite nudging about how the rest of the city's enormous budget might be used for services and things that can make a huge difference. You want to talk about your yeah. work and, and some of the lessons also that you think it would be really helpful to know that boom, boom, boom. Right. So one of the things that we have seen that is making a, a huge impact and difference is really strategically working with community. Um, we've always talked about community as our partners, but I don't think we've ever really opened the doors for them to understand what their role can be in the criminal justice system. Um, the criminal justice system has largely been left to the professionals that have law degrees and those who are lucky enough to be elected uh, as judges. But we have created what we call participatory defense. And that is not my brain child. It was uh, born in uh, San Jose, California, but we brought it to Philadelphia. And what we've learned is that when you inform community about the process of the justice system, because it's been a very non-transparent process to people who it really matters to, right? I mean, imagine going through a system not knowing what you're getting ready to get into mm -hmm. or knowing what could happen. That is the worst predicament that anyone should ever be in. If you are going to go through a process where the stakes are so high, where you could be branded with a criminal conviction for life that really leads you to a life of second class citizenship, the least we can do is explain to you what it is that you're going to go through and how you can help your opportunities for better outcomes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, we did just that. And we started working with community partners uh, and created what we call community justice hubs, where they actually don't, they don't service their community, they empower their community. So they teach people about the process that they're getting ready to get into. They teach them about what each hearing 
means and what work they can do to make those hearings go better. What we found is that it has given us an enormous amount of understanding about the person and the circumstances and conditions under which they live that gives us a better opportunity to look for different uh, alternatives here. Uh, what we've seen is that when we're able to put kind of the meat on the bones of a person, because most of the time defense lawyers get a police report and a rap sheet, mm -hmm. you know, there's not a lot of information that we get and we have to pull teeth on the person being accused to try to get those those other nuances that they sometimes can't explain themselves it's been so normalized to them but when we work with community and they pull information out we're able to get so much more of the picture and bringing that to a decision maker early on has allowed us to do things like divert has allowed the community to step in and say i know this program works this program is not in the purview of the courts or the district attorney, but this program is hands-on and it's helped many kids or many uh, you know, women. We're bringing in different services into the purview of the courthouse through using uh, community this way. And these are services that actually already exist in the communities, but just are not really advertised. And um, it's time to really focus on the services that are actually helping and stop putting so much money into those services that give us so much repeat recidivism. It's in, in that, I don't think we've done yet. We haven't assessed the quality of the services that we use now or look for new ones that get to some of the new understanding of what kids and, and women uh, and you know people of color are going through. So that's some of what we've learned, that that strategic partnership, that intellectual you know capability for us to have now has been working um, small scale we're hoping to bring it to a larger scale but there's about five participatory defense hubs in Philadelphia now and we've opened the first juvenile participatory defense hub in the country here in Philadelphia so that's what's going on here that's great I, 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 <laughs> I want to follow up because that's fantastic and important work. And when you describe it, it sounds so logical. But I know getting from there to here <laughs> yeah, uh -huh, isn't easy. And what were some of the challenges that you've, what are some of the challenges you've seen, but what are the, some of the challenges that you're still trying to work thing, through? Things that people should think about when they're doing that. And the, if I knew then what I know now, we might have done X. So the challenge is, is that we would have a strategic plan for communications about this. Um, we were just doing. Mm -hmm. And in doing, sometimes you don't stop and say, hey, what are my data metrics and how do I put, bring this to, to the purview of people to say, hey, this is actually working. Mm -hmm. um, we started that a little late, but now we've got some really good data to say, this is actually working. One, 100% of the people that go through the hubs go to court every time no one has missed a court date because they're much more accountable with community. Uh, we would also be bringing to the purview of the politicians, learning how to talk their language about what that means because sometimes we talk, tell them that this is a viable resource for accountability, but also for better outcomes and, and reduce bias decision-making. They don't get it because they're not in this world. Mm -hmm. And so trying to really get them to buy in to the fact that this is here and needs to be supported with some funding. It doesn't cost a lot, it costs a lot less than jail, um, is something that we didn't start out doing very well. So I would say um, if I had the resources that maybe Larry had, <laughs> had all those great people, criminologists and you know, data analysts, I would have put that in the very beginning. Um, I would have probably gone to a Kevin Bethel, who has won the insight, the knowledge, but also uh, the understanding of how to bring all these wonderful initiatives to scale by putting information uh, to the forefront. I would have really engaged people that have done that on a higher level. I'm a doer, and that's what I do, and so that's what I started doing. Um, I needed to be much more strategic about how we communicate it. Kevin? So for me, the, the, the transformation was just, my space now is really looking at pre-arrest diversion and, and getting upstream until they get it figured out <laughs> <laughs> and get the supports they need. How can law enforcement make a different decision uh, and, and understand the impact that has? And so for much of my work, you know, as indicated earlier, and a plug for, I'm doing a, one of the sessions after this for an hour and a half to really explain more, 
was really first to tackling the school to prison pipeline here in the city of Philadelphia. You know, and, and you'll hear me in the larger session really talk about looking at the data and sitting there one day and saying, oh my God, I do this to these kids? Really? And I'm born and raised in the city, you know, I went to Catholic school for elementary school and then I went to middle school and public school and high school. I got in trouble, I'm not asking for corporal punishment, but if you got in trouble, the nun take you up on the third floor and take a yardstick and hit you and say, don't do it again. Um, and I look down on a piece of paper and I'm looking at all these hundreds of 10 year old kids that I've arrested for coming to school with a pair of scissors, getting into a fight, um, bumping a teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and for me, it, it, it was one of the hardest things I, I, could, I ever did because for a long time, I looked at the data from, strictly from a crime fighting process. When I looked at the data and started to ask who, what, when, and I think uh, the DA mentioned that and, and Kira does in her work as well, I sat there and I said, I, I can't do this. You know, first and foremost, I mean, the majority of the kids I'm locking up are African-American, Latino youth, majority African-American, born and raised in the city. I'm running the show, ladies and gentlemen. I run the school police, the security officers. I run the officers, and I am allowing this to happen. Mm -hmm. you know, and so me, it was like a sledgehammer. You know, I tell people, and you, you'll hear me repeat it in my session, but I said my clearance rate for locking up homicides was around 45%. My clearance rate for locking up people who engage in shootings in the city, around 20%. What do you think my clearance rate for was locking up children in school? 100%. You know, what, was, what were we doing? So I would embark on a process of just saying, you know what, I'm, we're not going to do it anymore. At the time, the DA wasn't there, but it was someone else there. But, you know, I was working with George Mosley, who's a phenomenal first deputy at the DA's office who now runs a program in the community. And he kept looking at me, says, Kev, uh, well, what do you want to do? I don't want to lock him up. Okay. I don't want, I'm, I'm arguing with him. I argue with him the whole time. And he keeps saying, well, if you don't give them to me, then I don't have them. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm, and I, ladies, I'm, gentlemen, I'm going at him. I am arguing the whole time. And then he leaves and I go back and I sit down. And I said, he said, Kevin, if you don't lock him up and I don't have them, you do what you want to do. Uh, and that was a very empowering moment where I made the decision that we weren't going to lock up. And I was not, and, and I don't say this out of arrogance, you know, this system was not going to change if I got into a room with all of these great, you know, folks who were going to, it had been like that for decades. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of kids were being locked up. It had to be a hard stop and shift. It was not going to be an academic exercise where I lock one up, let one go, and let them open. No, 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 we're not doing that. You know, it, it was going to be a decision that we had to stop. And, and when we made that policy decision from a law enforcement perspective, and you'll hear me talk about it in more detail, and we dropped on 71%. I mean, we were on pace this year to do maybe 250 kids for a system that used to do 1,600. That was a policy decision. And so part of what I do now is really trying to encourage my law enforcement leaders you know, if we get out in front of it, if we play an active role in that, if we can do, and we move our kids into services without engaging the system at all, there's no penalty if they don't engage in the system, so there's no collateral consequences of that, that we can have a different outcome and have a better relationship. If I have a better relationship with a 10 year old now, what's he gonna think about me when he's 20? That's right. That's you know, and if all he sees is I'm locking up his kids, his colleagues, but if he sees I'm providing services, he or she says, hey, you know what, that cop, he's a decent guy. You know what I mean, he really helped me. And he made me and gave me the tools to me keep moving on. So much of my work now is really in that space, you know, convincing law enforcement and particularly organization leaders that we have to make a different decision. When you made that decision, what was the public reaction? Oh, you know what? Listen, sometimes, and I get sometimes I get a little frustrated <laughs> because you know I was telling I was I was talking to someone earlier. I said, you know, Philly's like kind of unique, right? It's his little pockets as they know. Some people care about a lot of stuff and a lot of people care don't, about nothing, you know? And, and so I didn't really get, uh, I wasn't getting at the time when we made the decision, a big push from the community to say, we don't wanna lock up the kids in school. Um, I wasn't getting a lot of that small pockets of, of individuals. Um, I think it had been going on so long that people just accepted it as being part of the process. So they didn't even know any better. It had been going on for so long 30 years of 20 something years of locking people up. I don't think they even knew that was a, a different process. Um, and, and so it really was, uh, um, and still to this day, I mean, we just kind of, 
you know, Martin Luther King says, you know, it's all, it's time is right, is always right to do, you know, what is right. And so it was the right thing to do. Um, and it, it was the most rewarding thing. It took me out of policing. This work took me away from retiring and going into a life of service to do this work because it's so important to me to, to lend that voice to, to how we can do it. And I think the folks are catching up now. Mm -hmm. I think people will see it as it gets elevated by the folks on the stage and others. Uh, and, and obviously having this audience here, it gives us an opportunity to, uh, to really raise the level. But I will say this, one of my biggest concerns is, is when, the, when here it talks about educating the community, you know, we have folks in our, particularly in our tough communities that believe locking up a kid will save her, my son. That if I get him into the system and I get a judge to put an ankle bracelet on him, get him in at 10 o'clock, I'll take that over because he, I don't want him to die in the street. I mean, and so we have to have real conversations about how folks have said, yeah, you know, I want her to take my son. I want the DA's office to, to take my daughter because they're going to save him for me. And they don't realize as, as, as the DA and they both have alluded, it doesn't. But many of them. And so that's why I think it's so important what Kira's work is doing is educating the community about what does it mean when you put them in this system? And do you think the outcome you may be think you're going to get may not be that? outcome that you think all long term it, 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 the results you're going to get well yeah. i i hope you are right i live in richmond virginia mm -hmm. and a friend of ours uh who's in the house of delegates is working on legislation to address these issues and it failed um this go round. but we're talking about exactly what you're talking about young kids for for basically nothing and the the numbers are just mind-blowing and moving the public and moving the legislature around this this work is is hard. And, and even for your audience, the collateral consequences, those consequences are so important. These fines and fees that keep our kids in, in, in these systems have to go. And so when you go back to your community, what are the fines and fees? I mean, it's one thing to tell it, hey, a hundred dollar fine and he or she can't pay that and she stays on probation because she can't pay a hundred dollars. Really? Right, right. People are yeah, making, I mean, and jurisdictions are making money, Yes. as we all know, yes. off of low, poor people and, yeah. and people of color Absolutely. Um, in this way. It's like, oh, we aren't, we aren't raising our taxes, but instead we're fining and penalizing yeah. people. Oh, you have to read the first 15 yeah. pages of the Ferguson report and I tell you how using exactly. folks in the community to raise money for budgets. Right. So one final question before I turn to the audience. And looking forward a little bit, to our next election and the issue of mass incarceration. And I'm wondering what you all, how you all think this issue can and should play a role in that election and also what work can local communities do to drive positive outcome uh, on these issues? Larry, do you wanna sure. start? Sure, uh, number one it is, I mean, I have never seen an election in my life and I'm 58. 58. I've never seen an election where everybody wants to talk about criminal justice reform. Everybody wants to talk about getting people out of jail. This does not remind me of Richard Nixon even a little bit. So it is a moment and it's, it's for real. You know, it comes at the end of a period of really important books around the subject, starting probably with Michelle Alexander, et cetera, et cetera, Brian Stevenson's book and so on. So it's there. It's not a question of whether it's going to be there. It's there. I mean, you know, the big knock on Kamala Harris, and I'm not taking a position here, but the big knock on Kamala Harris is that she wasn't progressive enough when she was a DA, right? So it is there, and it seems to be, you know, significant. When you turn on the news and you see that the big news of the day is that Bernie Sanders says people who are in jail should be allowed to vote, something's going on. Um, it's going on for a reason. It's going on because when you get to the point where one in three black men will experience jail in their lifetime, the accumulation, the weight of that on their sisters and their cousins and their brothers and so on is so enormous that there is going to be a response. And it is not just people of color. We have an absurd level of incarceration and supervision that affects so many people, including employers who are just trying to get the work done, but they got employees who got to run to probation for seven years when it should have been about you know six months. That sort of thing. So it's going to be there. And what can be done about it? Obviously, one thing that you can do is you can hold your prosecuting authority accountable and you can hold your judges accountable where they are elected and where they are not elected. You can hold accountable whoever appoints them. Too often, people go to uh, the polling booth. They have no idea 
who these people are who are running for judge, and they have no idea who these judges are who are running to be retained for another term. Well, find out. And there are activists in the community who are really interested. And because of the metrics that are available, they're starting to keep report cards. There are judges out there. My wife, by the way, is a judge, has been for 19 years. I have a lot of love for all kinds of judges, including her. <laughs> uh, but there are judges out there who are paid, you know, well. They're paid $150,000, $200,000 a year, and they will spend $4 million in a day locking people up when half of that was wasted or three quarters of that was wasted. They are stewards for so much of our resources. They have the capacity to absolutely waste the entire budget for your public education system and all the other systems that you know you need. So ultimately, in my mind, the solution here is political. It's called vote. And it's called vote young people, and it's called vote and find out what you need to find out in order to vote. So I would say that um, criminal justice issues are our biggest present day civil rights moment you know it is it is a real issue with civil rights i think what we've seen is that an era or or two of uh war on crime has only driven people deeper into poverty uh has devastated communities has created generational poverty and dysfunction and i'm not just talking about based on your economic ability but based on the mental trauma and instability that one has after serving lengthy sentences for very minor crimes the things that people go through in those prisons, in those institutions, um, no one could really explain that effect and impact that that's had. We're now learning that. And I think that it's not been really exposed at how devastating that we've left a lot of people in communities because that will have to require someone to answer for that, someone to be accountable. Um, I've always said the criminal justice system is the biggest industry that has zero accountability to anyone. I remember the healthcare, uh, when Obama was looking at healthcare, he actually started to level penalties, uh, levy penalties against institutions that had a high rate of readmission. Because he's saying, if people keep coming back, there's something wrong with your process rather than blaming the person. Well, the criminal justice system works just the opposite. We blame the people because they keep cycling back, but never the institutions that are supposed to rehabilitate and give services. And I think we're seeing that when we talk about what we don't have money for, well, what we spend on our criminal justice practices really shows our priorities and really shows our level of uh, non-compassion for our most vulnerable people in society, which government is supposed to protect. And instead, they're turning them into present-day slaves. They are making them work for 19 cents an hour for the prison industry and for other industries that buy into the prison industry. These are really, really instrumental things that are not really uh, talked about in the widespread way that they should be. Or really captured. We talk about the uh, the economic cost of paying for prisons, but what about the human costs that we have really come to learn that has suffered because of these practices? So for that reason, I believe that there's a lot of people that have either a moral obligation or a financial obligation to make changes in our in our current structure of our criminal justice practices. Yeah, and, and incentives, not only do we not look at the cost that you're talking about, but incentives often cut the other way. There are people making a lot of money um, doing exactly what you described. Kevin. So me, I, I've, I've always tr tried to, to look at things local. I, I, for me, especially in policing for 30 years, man, it's just, it's just local. A lot of this work is, is so local. I, it's funny, I, I used to sit there and get a position paper to say don't lock up kids in school, and then I get a grant from the, the government to say I can get $70 million worth of funding to buy as school resource officers. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. One minute you told me not to lock up the kids, but you're giving me grant money to hire cops, to put them in schools, to, to result. I want you in my group, man, because yeah, you, you and me and you are connected. You know what I mean? And so for me, I, I say all, a lot of this stuff, if you want consistency, if you want to drive your message, it's local. Is how much you put on pressure on your local. I mean, you have the DA comes in 1.5 million to fill up his own county, and you can make significant change because of the relationships. And I think for me, that's the space because if we if we get caught up in, in so much of, and I know there's those, they say a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, and 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 nothing ever really gets done. You know, you know when the feds and when when in that system and it can change and they see it from a different perspective. From my perspective. 
you know, I go and I walk in a room and I answer to the police commissioner of the city of Philadelphia and whatever he or she tells me to do. And he is, he's being guided by the mayor's position as to what he wants his law enforcement in the city of Philadelphia to, to be like. And, and, and that's what's going to connect with people in the community. It's not, you know, people used to come up with, well, now Trump is the president. I said, man, I don't, he doesn't have any authority to lock anybody up. I have the power. He could stand here today. The power of arresting someone on, would come with law enforcement. And so when do I give that liberty up to anyone or waiting for somebody? If you believe in what you're doing, if you believe in the community on a local level, believes this is not right, this is not what we want, you can really bring around a substantive change. And because at the end of the day, if folks move on, then will we wait for if the next person comes in, they follow the same kind of model, or do we say the next person has to stay in that model? And I, I think that's the challenge of the process. So for me, it's always been a local issue uh, and you can bring about that change in, in a very effective way. Thank you. Well, I want to open up the floor for questions now, but I um, <laughs> want to start with some of our young adult leaders. And Michaela Felix, I was wondering if you have questions that you'd like to ask members of the panel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, actually, I have been doing a lot of research, and to be honest, you guys have covered a lot of stuff that I was actually researching. Um, so I'll probably just highlight a little bit of what I have found out. Um, I know you guys didn't discuss anything about cash bails. I'm a type of person that wants to abolish cash bails because I think that's an economic issue. There's a lot of people that still bail themselves out, even if their, um, their, you know, their wealth is different. Um, what about mandatory education? I know you guys didn't talk about education in the justice system. Um, what about uh, voter registration? I know there's a lot of people that are incarcerated that can't vote. I know Maine and Vermont can vote while you're incarcerated. I know you guys didn't talk about that. Um, and also, <clears throat> and, the, and the last one is, uh, um, I know you guys talked about the police officers, but what about a new strategy? I was thinking of like having social workers as first responders instead of having police officers. There is a thin line between officers and social workers. Could we actually hire on social workers to be a part of the police force? Um, so hopefully you guys got all those questions. Yeah, you know, well, <laughs> we, we may not have a chance to get to all of them, but I'm wondering if members of the panel, if there's a question yeah. or a comment that you want to respond to. Yeah, eliminate cash bail and let them vote in jail. I want to, can I respond to the cash bail? Uh, recently, our office just pre presented a new vision for a system that relies less on cash bail to our uh, our judges, as well as to our DA. Um, it's something that we've both been looking at for two years, and we really reimagine our pretrial practices that gives us better opportunities to make some differentiation between people. And uh, we're really hoping that that's accepted by not just our judiciary, but also our elected officials. Uh, we've looked at the rule changes and the statutory changes, so it is really something that we have created and come up with as experts in this system that understand it so well. So I'm glad that that's on the tongue of young people like yourself. Um, you really get it and you understand how those decisions really create a whole mountain of issues in the back end. So we're hoping that that happens. Uh, I guess I'll speak to your social work uh, piece. <laughs> it's funny, I, I, you know, as a cop, I, I played all these roles. I've been a social worker, a psychologist, a judge. And I played all these roles. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that we, we, you know, clearly that's kind of outside the scope, but there are departments now to bring in public health experts into their space. They are bringing social workers into their space. Part of what we built in our program when we do a diversion is we move those to those services. So I, instead of playing those roles now, we partner with the Department of Human Services here in the city of Philadelphia, six community-based programs that have social workers and case workers and psychologists and drug and alcohol supports so that when we take that youth, don't cuff them, don't arrest them, we turn them over to a program that can get him or her into that space. Because it looks to be at the end of the day, if I have a child who's being beat or a young lady who's being sexually abused, in that context, she's not gonna give me that information. You know that. Right? And so part of it is building a relationship with that youth to be able to provide the services to get to the trauma. And so we do move those youth into that. Um, but again, there's a lot of conversation in our space now about how do we bring those elements into law enforcement? I mean, because we've been in our silos so long, I mean, tearing down those walls and saying, you know what, it's time to bring folks who are professional in that space to help us deal with a lot of these situations. They may not be at the direct line, but providing policy 
information and supports as to how best go about your practices. You know, I'm doing work in Baltimore on their consent decree where we are looking at an adolescent development approach, every policy, how do we respond to a youth within that policy? How do we interview a youth within that policy? And so I think you can immerse some of that in it, but you raised some very good points and it's part of the evolution of us in law enforcement is how much, how much of that can we bring into our space? Michaela? Hello everyone, my name is Michaela Wright. I am originally from Leavenworth, Kansas and I currently live in Seattle, so I'm a little tired and <laughs> jet lagged and confused, but I'll try to get through this. Um, I'm grateful to be here today um, and I wanna thank you all for being on this panel and speaking about these issues. I also wanna thank you as black individuals. I know how hard it is to do this sort of work and it can feel a little disoriented and have to code switch in that way or have to deal with this issue of double consciousness and what does it mean to be someone who's black working within the system. And I do have family members who work in prisons and they struggle with that daily. Um, so my hometown has six prisons. Um, so for me, it was difficult growing up in an environment like that because I saw my town invest so much into this system that was oppressing so many individuals and I saw so many of my relatives going in and out of jail and I saw some cousins get life sentences for minor drug trafficking offenses that never should have happened. Um, and so as I watched that environment, it was, it was hard growing up in a place like that because it makes you fearful. Um, even if you haven't done anything wrong because you see the cops watching you daily, you see them tracking your family um, and you see people dealing with these issues because they can't afford um, a decent lawyer because they get court appointed attorneys who tell them to just plead guilty, even if they're not, um, which did almost lead to my mother going to prison for years, um, just for identity fraud, which is horrible to think about. Um, but I was lucky enough to make it to college and lucky enough to eventually end up in Seattle and advocate for my community, which I'm grateful for, um, which, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, so now the young people I'm working with well, some of them are my age, but some of the young people I'm working with are working on producing a video around the school to prison pipeline just to really show their community what is this system, what is it like, what are our stories? Because as you all mentioned, this is something that a lot of our communities don't know about. They don't know how the system works. They don't know how to go through the court system. They don't know what's going on. Or they might know, but they don't trust themselves. Um, so I think it's important just to highlight that and have it come from the perspective of community. Um, I just wanted to touch though really quickly on some things that you all said just about reforming the system and that's something that's always bothered me knowing that the system was never created to benefit communities. The system is working the way it was intended to work. Um, so when we say things like reform the system, it, to me it feels like we're just putting a band-aid over it and we're not really addressing the larger issue which is that this system needs to be deconstructed and we need to revision it and figure out how can we actually help people. Um, thank you. Uh, so as I think about that, I'm really thinking specifically about people who have always been on the margins. So people like myself, as a, someone who, who is black and who, who grew up as a black girl and was disciplined, but people never noticed that. So we don't point out these, these data points, like black girls are six times more likely to be suspended, and we all know what happens to people who are pushed out of these school systems, they end up in prison. And this isn't to say that black boys don't struggle either, but their rate is only two times. It's the only experience suspension rates twice the amount of white boys do. So I just, I want us to focus on these people on the margins and to really uplift these communities and show these stories like what my family has experienced. And I really want us to focus on the fact that our justice system is not rehabilitative currently, it's, it's punitive. We're punishing people, we're assigning court appointed attorneys who are overworked, who aren't able to really provide the resources that people need. We have a bill bond system that leads to us taxing the poor and the wealthy escaping and being able to leave whenever they need to. Um, we just have so many issues like solitary confinement, which is a punishment and it can yeah. lead to so many mental issues for people. And I've heard horrific stories about people mm -hmm. in solitary, like they can't even touch a letter from outside. They can't even interact with any humans. And I can't imagine what that does to people's heads. So as I think about all these things going on in the system, what's wrong with it, my call to action or this even question is, what would it look like for us to focus on those people on the margins. I'm thinking about this especially for people who do work like me. Like how can we focus on, on black and brown girls who we often forget about? And for people who are working within the system, and I know this is hard because it's easy to get caught up in these structures. It's easy for people to shut the door and say, no, you can't do this. 
but what would it look like for us to take that money, those 30, that $34,000 a year that we're spending on each MA, and reinvest it into communities? Because as we're decreasing these incarceration rates, where are people going? What are they going back to? What kind of schools are they going back to? What kind of jobs are in those communities? Because right now there's nothing. Those communities have been devastated. They've been devastated for the past 40 years. What are they gonna go back to? We need to take that money that we're putting in this, this system that does not promote justice, even though it's called the justice system, and we need to figure out how can we save our communities and how can we help people. So that's my that's specific great. call to action. That's, mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a great question. Or <laughs> and, and if that's the way you sound when you're disoriented and jet lagged and confused, <laughs> I want to be disoriented and jet lagged and confused. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. And I'm wondering if you all have a reaction to Michaela's call to action. Um, and you've touched on some of those points throughout. I would say I accept the call. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, uh, as a leader in an organization that is public defenders, um, I have looked at this work differently. I don't think that we're just called to do what our work in the courtroom, we are called to do work beyond the courtrooms. We're called to look at social justice. And so some of my um, policies or initiatives go to overhauling the system, not just kind of chipping away at it, but really restructuring and working with people to have a shared understanding of what do we want our system to work for? Um, but also drawing, bringing community in to those decision-making points builds that trust, builds that alliance, and builds that understanding. Community has come in and provided a better understanding of their tolerance for behavior than the courts because we have an inflated, and I say we, tongue-in-cheek, but an inflated view of what we're doing that helps the community, right? Well, we don't even know what the community wants. We don't know what they need. And they come in, and when their voices are now being brought in, to that space, they are able to put forth a better understanding of what we should be doing. And so that to me has been the best experience because their voices have been left out of the decision making of this system. And therefore they have not had a chance to understand what's really happening or really understand the power they have to explain to a person who's elected to do what they're supposed to do for the communities that this is not helpful. So it's not enough for me to say it's not helpful because people look at me like, that's what you're supposed to do. That's your role. But it's enough for me to bring people in that lends much more credibility to that. And I can tell you this, there's a myriad of issues that the criminal justice system has, but we gotta start somewhere. We gotta start with the largest drivers of unnecessary incarceration, which is mass incarceration, and that is bail and probation. We start with those, get those reformed, and I mean totally reformed, reformed in the mindset of what we're supposed to be doing, then we can look at all the stuff that's in the middle and start chipping away at that as well. But you're, you're right, you're, you're dead on point, and hey, you ever wanna come to Philly? Um, come on, we, we, I'll, be, I'll be open arms to have you come and help me figure this out. For, for me, I, I was very intentional with, in that space. Yeah, so when I look at the data, I really started to focus in on I'm a feminist, look, I'm raised by a single mother and I got three daughters, right? So I'm always looking at, like, where are my, my, my so when the school, when we looked at mates, 50 African-American girls get locked up over two years or coming in school with mates. What happens when we pull mates off the, the chart? My females, you know, you hear me, 8% recidivism because so fewer females are, and ladies are getting arrested. When we look at retail theft, you know, we're gonna do a retail theft. We have a, we have a project going on now in a, a pilot in Center City. I pulled two years of data, 750 kids. How many, what percentage do you think were African-American youth? 90, 90, almost 97% of the kids are African-American. Now this is not policing. This is the store owners. Stores say, I'm going to focus on these youth coming, and this is citywide. And so when we strategically say, hey, you know what? We're going to address that area. We can work to get up front of those issues. Because here's the thing, I, but I'll, you'll hear me say this, I'm not trying to lock up white kids either. So this is not about like, like lock up more white kids and so we can balance the scale so everybody will be like, hey, look, everybody's getting a piece of it. No, we're trying to equity and create equality across the process. I want all the kids to have all of the same, op whether you're a rich kid or a poor kid, you're getting the same opportunities. And when you do that, you can really work to, and from a law enforcement perspective, being very intentional about how you do that. Me, a lot of my young ladies were getting locked up for fighting in the school. Well, that's an area we took off the chart. So they don't get arrested for fighting in school. 
They don't get arrested for coming in school with marijuana. But guess what? All of a sudden, my ladies start to drop because those were very intentional areas where you're looking at where there's glaring disparities uh, in, in the system. And sometimes it just jumps off the, ch the chart for you. I would like to take questions from the audience. I see a hand that's gone, oh, lots of hands, um, gone up here. And then there's a, mm -mm. a woman's sister sitting right next to him. We'll take those two questions, and then I'll come I am, over here. Hi, I'm David from Oakland. Uh, much of the work that many of the organizations in our network uh, do is around connecting uh, communities with systems leaders. I'd uh, be interested in your experience where in trying to deal with systems reform in the uh, law enforcement and criminal justice systems. When you have communities that uh, have had historic distrust of uh, law enforcement, uh, and we're engaged in an effort in Oakland where, quite frankly, the community doesn't want the police not only at the table, but not even in the room uh, when we have that discussion. Um, and, uh, you know, many of us believe that everyone who's part of the problem have to be, you know, part of uh, figuring out the solution. And so for us, that's been a, a challenge we're working on. This is not just for Kevin, but this is for everyone on the panel. Where have you experienced uh, uh, that uh, that conflict, that disconnect, and what strategies have you used to bring uh, community and law enforcement, at least where th there can be a beginning uh, of a trust building and healing relationship. Great, and before you all respond, could you give the mic um, to the woman sitting right next to you, and we'll take these two questions. That's my boss. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He, he, he felt my hostility. <laughs> well, that sounds like a wonderful working environment. No, that's, <laughs> I'm just it, joking. It is, actually. I know, I know. I'm just joking. <laughs> um, thank you again. I appreciate all you guys' uh, service to our nation, but specifically to the city of Philadelphia. I, too, am a sixth-generation Oaklander. Um, I love my city, and I see so many similarities to this city here. Um, Oakland is also the home of the Black Panthers, as you all know. And my comment is, 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 is really to, to you, uh, uh, D.A. Uh, Krasner. I just want to appreciate you and thank you for um, your, your, you not opposing an appeal for, for Mamiya. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with Mamiya, um, Abu Jamal, please look him up. But just thank you. Thank you for your service. And thank you, of course, as well. <laughs> you don't thank me? I mean, no, 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 no. I'm, 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 I'm working on it. I'm working on it. No, no. <laughs> so do you, you all want to respond to the question about distrust, friction between the uh, officers and other officials in the community and the community the, itself? And how do you, what strategies to begin to, to bridge that gulf? So, I, you know, I think the DA's office sits in a funny position because, in my mind, it's not just historic and appropriate distrust of law enforcement in terms of police. And, I, you know, again, we can't stereotype that group just as we can't stereotype any other. It's distrust of prosecutors. And it's justified. There are, you know, it is, what do you say when DNA not only proves that there are so many people who either sat on death row or were executed or sat in jail for big chunks of their life and they were innocent. And what do you say to that when you see that 25% of them confessed to a crime they never committed with details of the crime they never saw and then signed it? What do you say to that other than obviously something really inaccurate and really unfair is happening here? So, you know, I see as part of our mission as we go and we look back and we do on occasion exonerate someone, uh, release them from custody, overturn a conviction, or we say that death penalty was unfair because the attorney was underprepared. I think a lot of what we're doing is simply a way of showing the community that we intend to be even-handed and that we intend to be fair. I don't think that the average person expects the DA's office to get it right all the time. I don't think they expect the police to get it right all the time. I think what they expect is that we're going to be honest and we're going to try to be fair about it. And what that means in my mind is that when I have a juror sitting in the jury box and we honestly believe someone is guilty and we're presenting that evidence fairly and we're turning over the evidence that helps the defense to the defense, I think that juror is more likely to say, 
well, the fix used to be in. I'm not so sure the fix is in now. I actually think this district attorney's office doesn't even let certain police officers testify when they think that they are a bunch of liars. So I think maybe I'm buying this case. But I actually see a world where jurors are more likely to trust police and they're more likely to trust prosecutors when you do everything the right way and observe everyone's rights. Now that to me dovetails with what is obviously the bigger issue. We have almost 7,000 police officers in Philly. We have 600 people in the DA's office. So the bigger issue obviously is the interaction of police in the communities. But I think it dovetails there. When you, when you come to the point of saying, we're just not just going to try to win at all costs. We're not just going to try to convict you at all costs. We're not just going to test a lie and we're not just going to fabricate what happened and how it happened. We're going to tell the truth. When you come to that point, then I think in the minds of many people in a community, when the illegal stop and frisk stops, it's no longer in their minds an occupying army. And when the DA's office ain't cheating and detectives aren't beating you into confession, they're no longer unfair. And when you get to that point, honestly, we can solve more crimes because there's more people in the community who are going to be willing to come forward and say, I'll give you information because I know you're not going to turn me into the perpetrator. I'll give you information because I know you're going to be fair and you're gonna take what I have and you're not gonna to try to convict the innocent. Nice. Mayor? Sure, Mayor? and then I'll go question over here. I would say that, you know, uh, we sit in a unique position too because the public didn't trust us either. As, as the public defender's office, we saw ourselves as community lawyers and the public saw ourselves as, no, you're part of the problem. And so this has been an ongoing effort for us to really re-engage the community in unique ways and give them access to our world. So I think some of it is that if people don't know what you do, if you're always doing it behind scenes, they don't trust it because they don't have a, a, a say in it. You're always doing your stuff and telling me what I'm supposed to get from you. But if you're truly committed to working with community, you got to go in and you got to be more transparent. You got to be consistent too. Because one of the things that we had to learn is we couldn't just pop in when there's, a, there's an uprising or a town hall. We had to have create space where well, we went weekly, sat for two hours every week, and really hashed out how we were going to do this process, where we shared power. And that's what helped us bridge that gap. Still got a long ways to go, but it's actually showing, proving to be valuable in working towards the trust and empowerment and understanding of people. And therefore, we've been allowed to do many more things uh, together. So I would say lip service is People know lip service, they know it. Uh, it's just you showing up, being there, and willing to be open and honest about what it is that you're trying to do. Great, thank you. Question over here, yes. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dionysus August. I represent Newark, New Jersey. Uh, and for the panel, a uh, major proponent of the work that I do deals with mental health, especially mental health in black communities, uh, specifically in my young black men, as we deal with a plethora of things in our communities that force us into a stature, so to speak, that makes us appear as beasts as compared to men. Uh, and in Newark, we are working on being a trauma-informed city. So I would ask the panel, dealing with the uh, amount of police officers that you may or may not have engaged with, or even going over statistics, statistics or even uh, understanding what you know about re relative communities, what are three major mental health gaps that you feel like need to be addressed within the police force for officers to understand how best to engage with people with mental health gaps? I don't know if I have three, but, but I think the biggest key is just is training. You know, I mean, you, know, you have to understand that, that oftentimes, you know, we talk about trauma, and I know, I know you're over there, but for me to know a child's trauma, somebody's got to give me information about that child or that youth. And oftentimes the rules and regulations and, and HIPAA and FERPA and all these things say, well, you can't tell me that. So in that moment in time, I'm, I'm required to make this assessment. And it may be a, a very, it may be a period of time, but oftentimes it's in seconds and in minutes that I have to make a decision that this child is some maybe on the autism spectrum, that he or she may have an individual education plan, that he or she may be suffering some mental health. And so the more we train our men and women in the field to understand what that is, to understand what her trigger, trimmer, uh, triggers for her trauma may be. When I put a hand on a, uh, on a young lady and she goes absolutely ballistic, you're like, well, what is that? I think it really comes down to you know, training and, and you see uh, many of the, uh, that is underway with youth mental health aid, you know, CIT crisis intervention training, you know, those types of training 
but it, it really comes down to training, 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 and more training. But at the same time, and then having some place to take that child when he or she is in crisis versus taking them into a, you know, physically 302 them, and, and, and in our case, that would be physically apprehending them and taking them to a, where's the space to take them as well? It's one thing to say, all right, you're going to deal with them in a moment. But, you know, I, I'll see, you hear me say that. Well, if I lock them up, I got wrap around, wrap over, wrap all the servers. When I don't lock them up, I often ask, well, where's the services? And people look at me like, well, okay, um, I'm not sure. I mean, call this number. You know, so part of it is really building a system mapping so that the men and women and the officer who would contact that youth can look in his booklet and say, hey, you know what? This is what I have, and this is where I can call to get the supports I need at 10 o'clock at night. You know, and, and not after, you know, a lot of stuff happens after four o'clock when everybody goes home. And so I think really about building that out. That's it. Can take one more question. Do you have anyone? There's, there's one here and then one over to another side of ah, the podium. Great. Right okay. Take one here. Do you have a mic? Great. Thank you for um, all that was said on the panel. Good morning. My name is Kimberly Pham. I am born and bred Kensington baby. So a lot of stuff that you talked about um, really resonated for me. Just want to share like three situations. I've seen my girlfriend, you know, incarcerated, had a baby, sheriff beside, had that option where, you know, if her mother or somebody of her family wasn't there, somebody was going to take her baby away. I have lost a lot of friends into the system, doing 20 to 40. We've been in and out of Vision Quest, juvenile placements and all that throughout our childhood. Um, and then and by the time you reach adult 18, you're gone now, you're roofed basically. Um, man, and now with, um, you know, just being a, a member of Kensington, playing on the front of my steps, G and Allegheny to be specific, to now throwing Ajax, to me going to school for social work, to try to have a heart and also, you know, find a balance, you know, because it's also trauma. And sit here with everyone, you know, and act like everything's okay. So, and also the options that you talked about, because these are conversations we have every day in the city, is that, damn, you know what? He's better locked up than he is dead, right? Because we are losing a lot of people in the, in the street. So my thing is, like, the justice system seems so separate and divided. And we constantly say, like, reaching out to the community, when is, when is there going to be a us? Because I've gone to public meetings, and they're like, no, this is a public health issue. And they try to divide, like, who's going to you know, um, implement these resources in the community when it's about it being implemented effectively. So, you know, it's not just putting something there, but making sure, you know, that it's implemented effectively as well. Um, and also with gentrification happening, how do we kind of, like, we see that right down the street. You have a new Kensington and you have old Kensington. You have issues from Somerset being pushed up, like when the, you know, with the barriers being created around the tracks, it was great, but it also raised the issue that we have a huge displacement issue on top of huge addiction issue. So, you know, just I just want to find that, that sense of the justice system not being divided at these tables that are trying to, you know, um, actually make, create solutions and implement them. Yeah, like where do we kind of see that, that culture shift for for the for law enforcement, for the justice system, for the courts and stuff, you know, seeing more of that village approach throughout, not only as a juvenile but as an adult as well, because a lot of these people, you know, we know the data, we know what's going on in these communities. One nine one three four has been like this for the last twenty seven years of my life, so, you know, it just it got it has to have some accountability, but you know regardless of who is under administration, that the mission stays the same, that the city of Philadelphia is at its best. We're, we're supposed to be the first city or whatever, and I'm just not understanding how we're so behind on so many things. Thank you. Yeah. And integration. I really, really 
think that we've got to do better PR around these participatory defense uh, community justice hubs. Because what they are doing is they're doing the work and they're learning about the system, not through my mouth, but through their own work and understanding. And they are coming in with better things to do and better solutions, better options, better outcomes than we could ever imagine by ourselves in our own silo. And I would say, be the change you wanna see. If you have, wanna infiltrate this system, become your own justice hub. We will train you on how, what the system is, and then the rest of it is yours. You come, they come into those courtrooms, they listen, they work on cases, they do all the things without a law degree. But guess what they are doing? They are becoming more empowered and more empowered every day to take their people back and to demand for the elected officials. If we had this, we wouldn't need the justice for this. The understanding that that has brought and the solutions and the ways to talk to politicians from an, from an informed perspective has changed the game. But it's not being widely discussed. And I would fault myself for not really figuring that out. But also, I would definitely say those who are involved and know this and have access to uh, resources and communications, let's talk about what these people are doing. When you hear them get up here and talk about the problems from the justice system, it's not a complaint. It's an understanding and then a solution. I've not seen that before, not. And this is happening here in your city. And I would say Kensington needs a hub. They need a justice hub. And if you want to do one, you want to start one, we will come out, we will work with you. And the people from San Jose, California, I don't know if you heard of Debug. Yes, you know them. See, that? See, they, they, they're big. They're here in the East Coast now. Raj comes up here once a month. He'll work with you. They know what it means to have community organized around justice system practices. We're just beginning. And it could start with you in Kensington. Great. Her phone number well, is 215. <laughs> 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 well, first of all, I want you all to join me in thanking this panel, not just for today, but for all the work Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all your work. Do you mind touching me like that? You, you touch me? Okay. <laughs> And thank you all for your fantastic questions. I know there are so many more.